the second John Creedy Memorial Lecture here at Policy Exchange. <coughs> it's a great privilege to be able to commemorate the life of John Creedy, who, as many of you know, was Senior Crown Prosecuting Counsel in Belfast for many years, prosecuted successfully many of the worst terrorists of the Troubles from the time of the original Malvern Street murders of 1966 by the UVF that uh, many think kicked off the, tr the spate of Troubles from the 1970s through to the 1990s and ending with the first Al-Qaeda trial in Belfast in 2005. Tonight's lecture to commemorate John, which is always a joy, and who's a great friend, both of mine and of policy exchange, takes place, however, under a certain shadow. We were looking forward tonight to welcoming the Creamy family, his widow Evelyn, and uh, his middle daughter Hazel, and her husband Ted McMullen. Tragically, over the weekend, Hazel McMullen drowned in Mallorca and uh, is no longer with us. And uh, I, of course, consulted with the family, with Evelyn Creamy in particular, and the entire Creamy family were determined that this evening, in memory of John, should go ahead. We're, however, delighted that the family should be represented here tonight by uh, Lord Kerr of Tonnamore, Justice of the Supreme Court, formerly Lord Chief Justice of Northern Ireland, and John Creamy's star pupil at the Northern Ireland Bar. Please join me in thanking uh, the Creamy family and in commemorating them. And I know that I will wish your uh, good uh, wishes uh, to them. And I know they will be greatly heartened by your solidarity and support at this time. Thank you. should be delivering our lecture here tonight because uh, John Creamy embodied one particular characteristic throughout his professional and personal career and that of physical and great moral courage as well through all the years of the troubles, through all the threats, through all the moves of home. And I know that uh, John kept a particular weather eye out for those who didn't come from the province who came over whom he thought displayed courage, and particularly who displayed courage when they didn't have to. And he kept a, a particular rolling log in conversations with me of those policemen who volunteered from English constabularies to serve in the Royal Ulster Constabulary at the height of the Troubles. And uh, one of those whom he was particularly appreciative of was yourself when you joined the RUC in the 1980s from Lancashire Constabulary. At the time though there were dramas in Lancashire, I think we would all agree it was nothing compared to what the RUC had to go through. And, and uh, it's, uh, I know you always felt it was a mark of you and uh, it's, uh, it's a great privilege to be able to remind everyone here tonight of that uh, record of service. Paul, you need hard, I need hardly say any further words of introduction about you. We're thrilled that your first public address uh, since returning uh, to your post is here tonight. We know that you have much to say and that great dramatic events have been taking place in recent days which make your visit all the more timely and all the more upside. And we know that you will do John's memory proud and vindicate all that he stood for. Thank you. Well, thank you for that introduction, Dean, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and a, a thank you to Policy Exchange. Uh, for inviting me here to speak tonight, and I'm delighted to deliver this, the second Queen It Memorial Lecture. Before I go any further, can I echo your words about the very, very sad loss of Hazel um, the weekend? I understand it would have been her intention to attend this memorial lecture, uh, and I will join with you, and I'm sure we all join together, so we have deeper sympathies of what is the most difficult of times. Um, our thoughts are with her family tonight. Being away from the Met for 
several months has on occasion been both a painful, literally, and frustrating experience. But my wife tells me that she has suffered both with great dignity and she has no way now that she has sent it back to work. But it won't be a surprise to many of you that I did, um, as I started recovering my faculties, keep in close contact with my management board colleagues uh, during my various trials and tribulations. You know, not being part of the daily discourse of the organisation actually means your understanding of events and issues is much more informed by the press and the wider 24-hour media than perhaps would normally be the case. So I was interested when the Financial Times quoted no less than this August product, and I do genuinely mean that, the policy exchange a few weeks ago, suggesting that the lead for counter-terrorism might move from the police service to the new National Crime Agency. Now I will return to this subject later, but I was drawn in particular to the article's headline, and I quote, on the back foot, and a leader suggested that a series of, quote, missteps in London. Now I'm sure this was referring to my ongoing reliance on walking aids, and not at all to any silly assessment of the Met's performance during my absence. But I was also interested to read uh, that I came back early to take charge of the Royal Wedding, following the police in the TUC march when the Met were, according to some commentators, not sufficiently robust in our policing, yet for others, too vigorous in bringing charges against some of the protesters involved. It is not often that I can look to Simon Jenkins of the Evening Standard for solace. In fact, I don't ever recall that doing it before. But I do agree when he said, and I quote, I am not a customer sympathizer with the police, but sometimes they really cannot win. I have to say both parts of the are entirely accurate. <laughs> but I was later reassured to hear Nick Herbert, our policing minister, who tonight, in his speech to the Institute of Public Policy Research on the proposed introduction of police and crime commissioners, affirming the government's commitment to the maintenance of operational independence. And it is these three things that I will focus on in this evening's address. Entitled, Terrorism, Protest and Reform, Reflections Upon Turning to New Scotland Yard, and not as someone in my private office suggested, reflections from the Commissioner's sit bed. But before I speak on these themes, let me just echo briefly the, uh, some of your words about John Queenie QC, whose life is honoured by this annual lecture. Um, as Dean has said, he was one of the most important figures in the legal system in Northern Ireland for the past four decades. Best known for his role as a crime prosecutor, his career, as Dean has said, covered uh, a wide-ranging provincial terrorist trials and of course there was his first Al-Qaeda trial in 2005. And as we see the resurgence of terrorism in Northern Ireland, with the terrible killing of Police Constable Ronan Kerr, and the continuing threat from international terrorism, the resonance with John's life work continues. But so too are the themes of protest and reform. Anyone who lives or has lived in Northern Ireland as John did, will know the sensitivities and passions associated with parades and the very real difficulties of balancing the freedoms of one group against those of another. The right to peace and protest is a cornerstone of our democracy. Yet so is the right of those unconnected with protest to have their property protected and to go about their daily business. An incredibly difficult balance to achieve within Northern Ireland and one increasingly discussed and debated in the context of England and Wales. I will be touching later on the importance of operational independence within police reform. Of course, the underlying principle of operational independence is accountability to the rule of law. This is something which was very much evident in John's life. He was non-sectarian, both in public and private, scrupulously fair, and dedicated to the application of the rule of law, a man most worthy, I think, of remembrance. I'll now turn first to my three things of this address, counter-terrorism. The current threat level to the United Kingdom from international terrorism remains severe. It is worth reiterating that it is not a bureaucratic description, but rather a factual assessment of the reality of the threat that we collectively face. To be blunt, it means that an attack is highly likely and could occur without warning at any time. I sometimes think we, because we use it so often, we fail to fully digest the chilling nature of those works. As government, the police and security service assess the impact and consequences of the death of Osama bin Laden, it is clear 
that there can be no letter in our vigilance. Bin Laden led an organization which was responsible for the injury and death of thousands of people worldwide in the name of an extreme and perverted ideology, committed to the use of terror and murder to achieve their ends. However, <coughs> Black Man's death does not mark the end of an ideology, no matter how perverted. And we must remain alert to the continuing threat from Al Qaeda, its affiliates, and those acting alone. The police and security services will continue to work locally, nationally, and with our international partners to do everything possible to counter the terrorist threat. But we cannot do this alone. We need the help of the public to protect the country from the threat of terrorism. All communities across the United Kingdom have a vital role to play. As they go about their daily business, whether work, leisure or otherwise, vigilance should be our watchword. My message is a simple one. Public awareness can provide the essential edge. Members of the public <coughs> should trust their instincts and engage with us reporting any suspicious behaviour which may be terrorist related. Now I could spend some time uh, describing the many operations, arrests and convictions as well as setting out the evolving nature of the threat we face from international terrorism. I don't think we need to know the threat and you are very aware broadly of our response to that threat. <coughs> but I'm putting in mind of the words of Sir Stephen London, uh, former Director General of the Security Service a number of years ago, which aptly summarises the position. He said terrorism is here to stay. The circumstances that give rise to it may change and terrorist organisations and state sponsorship may come and go, but the phenomenon is very unlikely to disappear. <coughs> Thankfully, against this concept and every evolving backdrop, the police service, together with our security service colleagues, have achieved much. Since 2005, we've built a national counter-terrorism network from what had, prior to this, essentially been a London-based capacity and capability. That counter-terrorism network is now built around a series of regional hubs, four counter-terrorism units, or CTUs as we call them, and a number of smaller-scale counter-terrorism intelligence units established to complement the MPS Counter-Terrorism Command. Working to common structures, standards and procedures, they're overseen by my Assistant Commissioner of Special Operations and delivered by a Police Senior National Coordinator who can and does direct and control investigations in the event of a national counter-terrorist incident. But this is a developing structure, one which has been constructed on a 43 police force model with all the tensions and complexities which that bring and against the backdrop of unprecedented terrorist activity. So it is not surprising that further refinement is necessary. This is understood and is being undertaken. Most recently, the police service has led some very necessary reform of the centralised function of what we call ACPO TAM, or to give it its full title, ACPO's Terrorism and Allied Matters Committee. My, we do like our titles. This has seen the streamlining of processes to bring operational functions under proper governance arrangements. Most notably, the National Public Order Intelligence Unit, now renamed the National Domestic Extremism Unit, which now comes under the direct control of the Met and coordinates governance. They have also distributed portfolio leads by four work streams of the counter-terrorist strategy context contest to each of the CTU vice chairs, all chief constables of their own respective forces, not only increasing the stake in counter-terrorism across forces, but also reducing the size of centralised functions under what I've just referred to as ACPOL time. The formation of this counter-terrorism network has taken considerable time, effort and frankly sweat to develop. And yes, I do believe there is still further work necessary, but we now have in place a structure that does work well and has seen real success, a point of government, quite rightly in my view, recognised in their consultation document, policing in the 21st century. I believe there are a number of factors which contribute to this progress. Firstly, the counter's network remains very much an integral part of policing. Officers and staff are drawn from the local police areas into their regional units. The officers have local knowledge, they understand their communities, and there is a two-way flow of intelligence and information linking all aspects of policing with counter-terrorism. 
the community officer on foot patrol in their neighbourhood, the traffic officer dealing with speeding, the detective undertaking a search for suspect's house can all be linked to their regional counter-terrorism hub, conduits for information and intelligence and part of our national counter-terrorism policing response. There is a second linked point, the golden thread of policy, which connects local communities and a myriad of local partners through the policing arrangements I have described to the national and international structures. It is policing that uniquely provides this essential conduit. The counter-terrorism network's relationships with the 43 forces and colleagues north of the border is now well understood. There is a clear understanding of respective roles and who does what and when, enabling the police service not only to coordinate and deliver activity across force boundaries, but also to ensure an integrated response to the four P's of the government's counter-terrorism strategy contest. In the area of protect and prepare, a change in threat level leads to the implementation of well-practiced procedures for police forces across the country to heighten their security posture. And where pursue leads to executive action, the management of short, medium and long-term implications for communities form part of the policing response. Our activity in relation to prevent, for example, information sharing to local level, engagement with Muslim or indeed other communities, and support for those vulnerable to radicalisation is rooted in our local policing efforts. And this brings me back to the Financial Times article I referred to earlier. Quoting policy exchange, it talked about stripping away the Met's national responsibilities to better respond, it says, to the needs of Londoners and to provide proper heft for the new national crime agency by the transfer of our lead role in counter-terrorism. It also quotes, I can remember otherwise, that policy exchange as presuming that there would be strong resistance from the Met to such a move. Let me just comment briefly. I, as the Commissioner of the Met, can state quite unequivocally that territorial and organisational self-interest would be deeply unattractive for both me and many of my colleagues for considering what should be the appropriate structures for responding to the terrorist threat we face. Frankly, I am proud we are better than that. National security is too important to be determined by such shallow motives. Just as the protection of our citizens must be based more on more than mere structural convenience. And I can say this as someone who is on record as a consistent and vocal supporter of the need to maintain and further develop our national and local capabilities to deal with serious organised crime. Returning to the article, I can confirm I am greatly focused on London. But London is an iconic international city, representing, as we have witnessed, a significant target for the international terrorists. Just as the Commissioner of the New York Police Department devotes significant asset to deliver on his responsibilities to counter the terrorist threat in his city, alongside those of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the Commissioner of the Met would inevitably have to do likewise whatever changes we make to our national counter-terrorism structures. The difference here is that we enjoy a closely integrated approach between London and the national effort, an approach developed from experience and frankly envied by many of our international colleagues. The policy chain exchange hub, and I say this not merely out of good manners or, or, or because they are paying for dinner, a very fine reputation for evidence-based research in the form of policy development. And of course, I readily acknowledge that brief abstracts in a newspaper article will rarely, if ever, contain the broader research and context underpinning the conclusions reported. I understand that. However, this same approach must be the basis for underpinning any future debate on this country's national and local counterism structures. A very brief, quick counter through some of the current analysis might look something like this. We must be aware, as I most certainly am from my professional perspective, of the potential resourcing tensions of any organisational linking of counter-terrorism with serious organised crime. It is a factor. 
Whilst, as our financial advisors are always very keen to tell us, historic trends are not a reliable indicator for future performance. This was our experience historically in the Met, when previously the two were run from the same area of business. Inevitably, the management of risk invariably favoured the resourcing of the counter-terrorism threat, notwithstanding my commitment to deal with serious and organised crime. This is wholly understandable. Further, the counter-terrorism infrastructure, integrated within local policing and communities like I described earlier, has enjoyed real success, is highly regarded worldwide, and we should be careful only to dismantle it with good cause. Lastly, we should be conscious of adding further complexity and of the effects on key intelligence relationships by the creation of any additional organisational tiers within the counter-terrorism landscape. Perhaps of some relevance here at the conclusion of the 9-11 Commission Report of the United States when commenting on agencies' ability to connect the dots. The analysis I just presented is neither definitive nor exclusive and it is necessarily brief. And any future considerations must go deeper and wider. And let me make it clear again, I do not resolve from such discussions. They are important, we must have them on the positioning of our counter-terrorism effort. It must be kept under review. The subject is far too important for localism and parochialism. But it is critically important that those discussions are timely, that we avoid any unnecessary distractions as we both prepare for the Olympics and maintain our current level of operational activity, and that any conclusions are drawn on the best analysis available and experience. And I have to say, from discussions I have enjoyed with the Home Secretary recently on this matter, I'm entirely comfortable with her position on this matter. Now let me turn to my second theme of tonight, protest. It may be an irony that the Commissioner of the Metropolis set the scene for this part of his speech by quoting Shami Trakabati, the Director of Liberty. So perhaps this is where I refer to my recent medical problems and pray in aid the after effects of excessive pain relief medication. <laughs> but to be fair to each other, in Liberty's report on the recent TVC march, she stated, there is no such thing as a risk-free society, especially a free society that guarantees rights of association and peaceful dissent. Let me develop two things from this quote. The issue of risk and that of peaceful protest, especially risk. When we consider this, it is worth stating that the Met does have a wealth of experience in public order policing. In any one year, we typically deal with some 4,500 public events of varying size and scale. In the vast majority of these, we're able to facilitate peaceful protest, which is crime free, without incident, has a minimal impact on those not involved, and allows London largely to operate freely and warmly. And of course, these pass unreported by the media and the armchair pundits will certainly not gain any airtime or film newspaper commenting on these. And I have to say, whilst this is not the time to comment in detail on the disturbing and very sad death of Ian Tomlinson, I would like to take this opportunity to endorse the words of my Deputy Assistant Commissioner, Ross Fitzpatrick. It is a matter of deep regret that the actions of the Metropolitan Police Service Officer have been found to have caused the death of a member of the public. That officer will now be the subject to misconduct proceedings, and I believe the doubt of public prosecutions has made clear his intention for the future. Return to my theme, I would add that we have, for the last number of years, and I think for good and valid reasons, sought to reduce our commitment of resources to protests to better make officers available in our streets, in our neighbourhoods, and investigating crime and criminals. It's what the public wants. And we've been able to do that, as we have seen almost a decade, where we haven't seen violent protests within public uh, demonstrations. And of course, it is worth remembering that policing large-scale events is hugely resource-intensive. The largest Nottingham Carnival, G20, the World Wedding, TC March, have involved upwards of some 5,000 officers, give or take. Let me put this into perspective. 
The government has in excess of 32,000 officers. So to police one protest of this sort of scale, we needed some 16% of my officer's strength. If I were to factor in the large number of officers engaged in shift work, because we are a 24-7 business, and those working in necessary specialisms, the, the real percentage of abstraction from our neighbourhoods, from walking the streets, from responding, would be far greater. Of course, we have, in recent times, witnessed a significant change in the mood of protest, with a re-emergence of violent elements used in the legitimacy of peaceful protest as a cloak of protection to commit acts of violence, damage and disorder. Determination of resources to police such events can never be a precise science. And there is a risk of getting this wrong, as frankly we did last year when we saw the wholly unacceptable disorder at Bilbao. I was, you may recall, quick to publicly acknowledge as much on that day. <coughs> but as we now assign larger numbers of police officers to protect public safety, to respond to violence as a contingency against disorder, this significantly impacts upon the resources available for London. Unfortunately, officers deployed to police protests don't come solely from a box marked public order policing. The vast majority are drawn from boroughs and other commands vital positions across London. They are the officers who respond to travel nine calls, investigate burglary, motivate the crimes. And whilst we do everything possible to limit abstractions from this particular area, they can also be neighbourhood police officers. My borough commanders are telling me that local communities are noting the impact the increasing abstractions from public order policing are having. But returning to protests and my second Shabbos Court, peaceful protest. It was HMIC's report on the policing of G20, adapting to process, that sought to challenge our thinking on the application of human rights, and in particular Articles 9, 10, and 11, which collectively cover the right to protest. In that report, Sir Davis O'Connor, here tonight, advised that our starting point should be in favour of facilitating peaceful assembly and that we must consider the legality of the conduct and actions of individual protesters rather than consider the protest as a whole and respond to specific criminal offences committed and use police powers to deal with those offences. This creates a challenge, coined by HMIC as the policing dilemma. How to achieve the balance between the rights of the protesters, well enshrined in English law, with the duty of the police to prevent breaches of the peace, prevent and detect crime, protect life and property, as well important as allowing <coughs> those unconnected with an event to go about their business. And I do believe, I would say this, that we have enjoyed some real success in resolving that very difficult policing dilemma in some of the most challenging environments. In this regard, it is useful to look at the recent TUC march. Let's remind ourselves of the scale of the challenge. The largest protest in London, since 2003, with estimates of some half a million taking part, some four and a half thousand plus police officers deployed, and the presence of groups who, who would use the march as cover for violence. Disappointingly, and perhaps in the age of 24 7 media, not, not surprisingly, much of the reporting focused on the actions of those who used the cover of the march to achieve their criminal intentions. Breaking away, rejoining, changing clothing, and an array of other tactics to avoid identification, as opposed to the overwhelmingly successful elements of the day. And we did see acts of violence of varying nature by a significant number of people. For sure, a minority, but a significant number of people. At the Ritz, on Oxford Street, and later in Trafalgar Square, where wanton disorder continued into the early hours. Let me touch on some of the associated issues. Firstly, we should not romanticize the actions of protesters occupy or damage premises, preventing their legitimate use and intimidating them to the public, workers and indeed owners. It should not be a surprise when the police enforce legislation passed by Parliament to protect those premises. Secondly, containment, what the press prefer to call kettle, <coughs> remains a lawful and <coughs> tactic 
to deal with disorder by large groups. Containment is used to prevent and stop breach of the peace and to enable us to isolate offenders for the purpose of arrest. Containment is a tactic, as has been said by Lenoyans, Chris Allison, and many others in my organisation, of last resort. But sometimes it may be the only way to prevent serious disorder and violence. Is there a pausing and saying that the recent administrative court ruling, which we are appealing, did not rule against the use of the tactic, only that its application was not justified in the circumstances of the case brought? I recognise that when we apply the tactic, it is important to consider the needs of those contained, to communicate with them, and to enable those unconnected with violence to leave. We have improved our application of this tactic by preparing leaflets for protesters so that there are no or less surprises. Using social networking sites to communicate and challenge rumour, and in particular, we've established the role of a containment manager whose sole focus is to facilitate the release of those who are not involved in violence or criminality. <coughs> and it's important that we do continue to improve. Thirdly, there will be occasions when it is simply not possible or practical to prevent some offences of violence occurring. For example, for the TUC march, we had open source intelligence suggesting hundreds of potential attack locations, both specific and some less so. Did we respond by turning 5,000 officers into 6,000, 7,000, or more, just in case? We cannot, without lawful authority, search every protester as they arrive at a start point. Setting aside legality, it would be an impossible task, and I don't want to do it. We cannot, as some have suggested, preemptively arrest, unless of course the threshold of an attempt to commit a crime or conspiracy is properly met. Suggestions that the answer lies solely in better intelligence is frankly naive. Of course we should seek to improve our intelligence gathering, and we have, and we must, and it can be better. I am certainly not hostile to such challenge, as our intelligence activities around the Royal Wedding Show. However, many who got caught up in the hysteria of some of the recent protests and committed offences would not have been identifiable in advance of being of any interest to us, neither would it have been justified to deploy covert police assets against them. This council of perfection must not lead us into an inappropriate shifting of the balance between security and liberty, a debate that is still live and still requires further debate and further resolution. So in this context, it is understandable that on occasions we seek to deal with some offences through later investigation. We must, of course, be intelligence-led, occasionally a rather easy and trite phrase, but also we must be intelligent in our approach. I am not, however, complacent far from it, and I accept that we must continue to develop our tactics to allow us to intervene at the earliest opportunity. I recognise the difference between being able to prevent all illegality and responding satisfactorily as occasion demand. That is our challenge. I accept it. But it is worth remembering that whilst some of the electronic media focused on sporadic violence against a number of premises, and I understand that, we ensured in March that we ran for six hours to pass a single point. We remained peaceful, we meant the security of many key buildings and allowed London to continue with minimal disruption. I both regret and condemn the violence and disruption that did take place. But perhaps this needs to be set against some international comparisons, for example in Greece or France where we've seen protests involving buildings and cars being set alight way beyond we have experienced, thankfully. Petrol bombs gone, and cities brought to a standstill. I wonder which would appear to be the more successful fixing approach. As someone who's advert, who has observed this event from his home, rather than New Scotland Yard, which I have to say for itself is an extraordinarily frustrating experience, you would expect me to say I was a little disappointed the level of balance in some of the public debate. I have been around policing long enough to expect what in America, I believe, I referred to Monday morning quarterbacks. 
to use the benefit of hindsight to articulate a perfect piece of operation, even if drawn from the memory of events in their day that perhaps only they alone would recognise. But am I alone in wondering whether the array of reports and recommendations of protests, <coughs> the 24-7 media reporting, that quite naturally replay the same section of footage over and over again, given the impression of sustained rather than sporadic violence, as bad as that is, mm. and the demands for additional laws by some commentators, with others bemoaning the loss of liberty, has created a somewhat confused debate. Returning to Sir Dennis's report, <coughs> he quite properly highlighted the importance of focusing on peaceful protest. However, although it is clear that in a democratic society some level of disruption is to be expected from the exercise of freedom of speech and assembly, we must also take into account the impact on the rights of others who are affected by that protest. And I wonder whether, with the benefit of hindsight, both in the ensuing public and professional debate, we have lost the sense and importance of society's right to expect individuals to behave lawfully. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We do that, I think, at our peril. We should always strive to be better, and I do fully accept that challenge. I believe this applies to all aspects of policing, and indeed all aspects of public life. However, the narrative of perfection is damaging, false, and ignores the reality of public order, or public order policing. Throughout my 36 years of policing, I have been a passionate supporter and a passionate promoter of my belief and of general belief that the role of the police is to save life, prevent crime, detect crime, and maintain the government's of peace. This applies to protests, as it does to all aspects of policing. But we can only achieve this with the consent of our communities. Policing by consent is the bedrock of our policing model. Let us not erode that consent for the opportunity for sandbox, or to suggest that protests on the scale that we have reached the seed, and with elements intent in causing violence, can always be incident free. This is not about a commissioner providing excuses. This is about that's how a realistic debate. And I do think Shami Chakrabarti and Simon Jenkins' analysis perhaps provides some of the balance that has been a little absent in some of the debate. And whilst discussing public events of protest, I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge and thank the officers and staff responsible for policing of the Royal Wedding, uh, endorsing comments made by Kit Maltos, Boris Johnson, and indeed the Home Secretary, and I think also to various people in the Prime Minister. This was a large and complex policing operation conducted with the eyes of the world upon us. An estimated one million visitors in central London and some two billion people watching on television. The country can be rightly proud of London's police service on that day, as indeed I am. And I will also take the opportunity to say that whilst senior female police leadership may be a surprise and apparently a challenge to certain sections of our media, it comes as no surprise to me that Assistant Commissioner Lloyd who led this operation, and her entire command team and the staff who delivered it were superb. I would expect no less, neither would she, and neither would her colleagues. Now we turn to, turn to my third and last thing, reform. Since the NPS was first formed in 1829, accountability to both the law and the public has always been the fundamental bedrock of this. I have said many times that policing is far too important be left to the police alone. It is right that the police are subject to the most rigorous of scrutiny. We have great power entrusted to us. Civilian and political oversight is therefore vital. It is a necessary component of a necessary accountability framework. But few would suggest that the current oversight arrangements, police authorities essentially, are such a thing of beauty and perfection that they should not be reviewed and reformed as necessary, with the exception, perhaps, of maybe some police authorities. <coughs> my experience of a number of different police authorities throughout my career is that their capability and effectiveness varies greatly. Why would they? This was a point made by the Majesty's Inspector Constable's report, Policing the Governance in Austerity, which critically found only four police authorities inspected 
were judged to perform well in both setting strategic direction and ensuring, ensuring value for money, rather important qualities, I think. Across the landscape of peace authorities, very real achievement, and I do mean that, very real achievement, is combined with ineffective accountability mechanisms on occasions and sometimes sheer political theatre. From this, you may be wondering, or perhaps not, whether I'm a supporter of police reform and social responsibility bills, proposals for police and crime commissioners, known as PCCs, and for London, a mayor's office for policing and crime. Let me make it clear from the outset. It is, the, it is right that government and parliament decide the governance and accountability arrangements for peace. It is not for me or my professional colleagues to decide that. My role, together with those professional colleagues, is to inform that debate through the provision of professional advice. And I'm pleased that in a number of key areas, we are being heard. And we continue to play a proper role in informing the way forward. And so we must. Turning to London in particular, I have made clear previously that I can see why proposals for a narrow model of political governance make sense. And contrary to the times alluded today that suggest the method of resistance change, not a bit of it. It makes sense because of the existence of the role of there. We have one. Who hold powers to promote economic, social and environmental improvement in London. Our jurisdictions are coterminous. Policing complements many of the other functions within the responsibilities of the mayor, including transport. And there is a fit with existing political structures. And I'm thinking here of the GLA. The mayoral role is both wide-ranging and busy. He is currently legally entitled to chair the Metropolitan Police Authority and exercise this function through the deputy mayor for Police and Kit Malta, who is with us tonight. A move towards a more overt mayoral government model might be viewed as a natural, almost evolutionary development. The critical issue, of course, is the balance of the relationship, something we are currently working on, working through with government, the mayor, Kit, and representatives. In my view, it is entirely appropriate that we continue to work hard at that to get the right balance. And we must be sensitive to balancing the oversight a mayor can and should, in my opinion, bring with the maintenance of police impartiality as a critical underpinning of operational independence. Outside London, the reforms are clearly going to bring different challenges, particularly where there is not the same concept of the mayor, the quaternosity, or indeed political structures. Ministers may wish to examine the potential for a wider role for the PCC, recognising the opportunities to improve local crime and disorder arrangements in the round, out with the Chief Officer's responsibilities for delivering policing services against set strategic and policing priorities. However, this is rightly a matter for Government and Parliament, who will no doubt look to the lessons and experience of London as different as we are in some of our arrangements to inform their thinking on the appropriate government arrangements. Regardless of the accountability and government structures, the fundamental issue for me is operation independence, which in ensures non-partisanship of the police and the rule of law. But let me say I am pleased that the importance of operation independence is recognised in the Police Reform and Social Responsibility Bill currently being debated in the House of Lords. It will of course be important to ensure this commitment is underwritten by the checks and balances of supporting processes and that's part of our own discourse. It is this that will provide the foundations upon which effective complementary relationships can be built. On my experience of in, on a number of occasions <coughs> in the past, trying to get agreement between 43 chief constables positions me well, I think, to urge that the intentions of ministers on such critical matters are not left to the vagueness and unpredictability of 43 different interpretations by PCCs as to the meaning of operational dependence. I repeat what I've said before. It is properly the right and duty of politicians to establish the overarching framework within which PC operates, to sit with us and inform our priorities, to help us to ensure we have the logistics and resources to deliver them, that public money is spent wisely and appropriately, and then to hold us to account for the delivery against all of that. But if we are to retain a professionally led policing model, and I think we should, 
It must be that the police service returns the operational dependence to implement and deliver against the legitimate aims and aspirations of our governance structures. Elected politicians and governance arrangements are an essential and valuable part of the peace world, and they have an essential role to play, in my opinion, in maintaining that operational dependence that has been the cornerstone of the British policing system since its inception and so admired across the world. As Peel, one of the founding fathers of British policing and in the Met said, please seek and preserve public favour, not by catering to public opinion, but by constantly demonstrating absolute impartial service to the law. Politics and policing will always coexist, it always has. But there must be appropriate space between the two. Chief officers must have the space to do the job they're employed to do, otherwise there's little point in employment. Leading and managing the forces they're employed to lead, whilst being properly held account within the structure and relationships I've outlined earlier. Put simply, the decision of how to do it, who to target, where, when to act, what officers to use, and how many, are decisions, I believe, for me and my officers. And then I should be held to account by the government structures for the outcome I achieve, I achieve against the priority that is set by those structures. And when chief officers speak publicly, as indeed we sometimes must, to inform public debate by providing a professional view on policing matters, presenting the facts and speaking directly and indirectly to the public who pay our wages, we must do so wisely and with appropriate circumspection conscious of maintaining that appropriate space between policing and party politics, avoiding any suggestions of political impartiality. That is my, that is my professional colleague, that is APCO's enduring responsibility. Balancing this is the importance of ensuring new government structures avoid any impression that a chief officer of police is simply part of an administration, part of the hurly-burly of the election or re-election of the PCC. These are, I believe, statements that are blind in the obvious. But they are worth restating to safeguard Peel's founding principle of police impartiality that has served us so well over well over a century, almost two centuries. Consistent with this, chief officers must be able to determine the allocation of resources across a balanced policy model, both the visible and the less visible, that combine to deliver safety in our public and private spaces determined by operational need and the legitimately set priorities that emanate from our governance structures. Of course, just as now, with the more effective use of properties, the PCC will clearly have an important role to play in issues of overall policing style. It is the case that I do, and I will continue to have, important debates with the Mayor, the Deputy Mayor, Carol and Metropolitan Police Authority, and key aspects of policing. But I think we are all clear that this is not and must not be at the expense of operational independence and impartiality. No one wins out of some compromise. Much particular public. But structural arrangements are only part of the picture and alone cannot ensure an effective PCC chief officer relationship. This requires more subtle elements of trust, respect, and willingness to set aside self interest for the long term benefits of the communities we serve. I know that colleagues in discussions with ministers have stressed the requirement for clarity between management and governments. Unless anyone thinks this is about a commissioner being power mad, driven by a sense of ego and territory, I would contend that not only is this about the maintenance of impartiality and associated public confidence in the long-term retention of an important piece of the model, but also ensuring that the ability to hold us properly to account for delivery is not lost in the confusion of who does what. In one way or another, I have touched this evening across all the things I've mentioned on the notion of a balanced policing model, so essential to the delivery of police, the policing mission here in London, but also indeed across our country. Let me describe in just a little more detail about what I mean by this. A balanced policing model consists of a mix of beat and emergency response officers supplemented by specialist officers and staff undertaking a range of different and complex roles. 
This includes counter-terrorism, order, policing elements such as road policing, serious organised crime, firearms, and other sometimes invisible parts of policing, all necessary to keep us, our communities, and our families safe. In the field of homicide, it means the beat officer gathering community intelligence about a recent murder, supported by a team of detectives, forensic scientists, and analysts, surveillance officers, and occasionally firearms officers, working behind the scenes and sometimes visibly to solve the crime and reduce the risk. In the field of counter-terrorist policing, it looks like a beat officer <coughs> patrolling their patch, building community confidence, alert to signs that may suggest ter ter terrorist activity, balanced by the less visible but specialist colleagues leading counter-terrorist investigations and sharing intelligence regionally, nationally and internationally with partner agencies here and abroad. Maintaining this balanced policing model will be challenging in the current fiscal climate. We know that. PCCs must play their part in supporting their chief officer. They will need wisdom and care to ensure that the operational capability already too thin in many areas, such as serious and organised crime, is maintained. So in discussion with ministers, I do support the development of a strategic policing requirement, which whilst not so prescriptive that it stifles local creativity and accountability, has sufficient weight to properly balance the visible with the necessary but less visible aspects of effective policing services both within their local domain and beyond. This balanced model must value each of these necessary roles, but no one should misunderstand <coughs> my commitment to visible local policing. I passionately support what I refer to as the uniform governance of our streets, with officers patrolling our neighbourhoods and responding to local crime and social behaviour concerns, feeling a sense of ownership of our public spaces on behalf of the communities they serve. This is why it was the Metropolitan Police Service, along with colleagues nationally, and actually along with Sir Dennis Connor, who's here tonight, created and developed a safer neighbourhood teams, so valued by our communities a goodly number of years ago, demonstrably contributed to increased local confidence and playing their part in reductions of recorded crime. Here in London, I am very grateful for the continued support and commitment of the Mayor and his recognition of the successes we have seen through our commitment to neighbourhood policing. But my commitment to uniform governance of the streets goes beyond <coughs> safer neighbourhood teams. I've introduced single patrol as a default deployment position for uniform staff, effectively creating a large number of additional patrols daily. We've also mounted a sustained drive here in London to increase the number of special constables with the support of the Mayor, now sitting at just under 5,000 providing further uniform resources to support local visible policing. But the balanced policing model I have set out cannot be adequately described by frequently used terms, in my opinion, such as front line, front office, middle office, and so on. HMIC's recent report, Demanding Time, the front line and police visibility, suggests only 12% of police resources are visible and available to the public, just the figure published last year is 11%. Of course, any such simplistic extract of figures fails to capture the wider context and intention of such reports. Nevertheless, these figures have not unsurprisingly been seized upon by media and politicians alike. And I genuinely would say, why shouldn't they? These are figures put in the public domain by the profession in an attempt to publicly inform. However, in some respects, I believe it has achieved the opposite, creating a level of confusion and misunderstanding. I think it fails to take account, and such simplistic extracts fail to take account of the balanced policing model, shift work, a myriad of various police resources, some visible, others less so, present in our communities at any one time, protecting the public from the threats they face. Whilst the these statistics can be rather challenging number of levels, I will simply pose the following questions Perspective. Would the family of a murder victim view the homicide detective as being any less visible than a uniform colleague? Is a sexual offences officer any less visible to a victim of rape? <coughs> the officer working on a computer interrogating chat rooms 
to identify and target the paedophile using the anonymity of cyberspace, to groom the unsuspecting and the vulnerable, which thankfully leads to the early morning dawn red. Is that officer any less available to the victims he or she serves? The argument goes that there is too much emphasis on the visible and the available, and it, that this focuses too much on the impacts, whilst ignoring the effectiveness, quality of service, and delivery outcomes. That was never the intention, and I'm not using apologies for that myself. That was never the intention. But I fear it is worse than this. The abstraction of those figures without context fails to present the full breadth of what is truly visible and available. Put simply, I am frustrated by the oversimplification of the PC mission that the use of such language can lead. And I don't blame others for using them. It is for us in the profession, myself and colleagues in Apple, to ensure that we articulate the balanced policy model that properly represents what is visible and is available to the public. We should be using language which actually identifies what adds value for our communities and which victims of crime regrettably have reason to depend upon. As passionate as I am about uniform response in street patrol, we must not be seduced by an argument that says everything in uniform or fits some definition of frontline is both good and invaluable, whilst everyone else is an efficiency something waiting to be realised. Can we improve what police resources are truly available to serve the public? Of course we can, and indeed we must. We have no choice in the challenging financial times ahead. That is our responsibility, that is our challenge. But police leadership must be better at articulating what our colleagues actually do. We owe that to the people we lead and the public we serve. To close where I began, and to use the phrase of colleagues in my private office, reflections from my sick bed. As a recent patient in the Manchester Royal Infirmary, I received first class NHS treatment. Out of my comfort zone in every sense. During my period of, period of residency, I had the time to reflect upon what was important to me as a patient. I concluded three things were required. Competence, save life, Working in my place, my case, save my leg. Secondly, to make one feel safe. And then, of course, thirdly, to make one feel cared for. So I got all these in abundance is a very real understatement. Whilst I lead a very different profession, the parallels with the police service are clear. Any definition of police, and certainly the three themes of tonight's address, would have very little difficulty incorporating the words competence, safety and care in any mission statement. Thank you. Rule, no question to our rage is to have to stay the main organisation. Do you see any questions? Uh, Gentlemen there. Philip Johnson from the Daily Telegraph. Do you think it would be a good idea to pilot some of the new policies to use about contract formal definition? I sort of, I, sort of, I recognise your invitation to enter a political debate that's been taking place in the House of Lords. I've declined that, that invitation. <laughs> 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 the, the reality is that my job is to get on with ensuring I inform government and ministers on and their proposals, their legitimate proposals, that's what I'm doing with colleagues, and then get on as they implement them in making sure they work here in London. Um, actually, in a funny old way, I do think that whatever happens in London, and I would say this, we will work in London, and others will look and seek to follow if we get it right. And that's the important point. Uh, frankly, the debate on power to otherwise is a matter for the Minister, the House of Lords, and various politicians. But thank you for the invite, Philip. I'm very grateful. <laughs> Lord McGuinness, the question of under one minute. <laughs> I don't know why you're all resources questions. Thank you, Commissioner, for a, a very interesting and very broad uh, delivery in, 
in terms of what you do. But one thing I want to mention worried me about what you had to say. And it appeared that you, as a leader of police, was prepared to sacrifice a constable whom I believe should have the full support of the police service. An innocent person does not wander in the forefront, innocently in the forefront of a police, of, of, of a riot situation. And whatever that police constable did that may have been out of order, it was up to somebody to put a hand on his shoulder and say, easy son. The idea that you're going to surrender to the vagaries of the press who've been calling for his blood horrifies me. I spent 30 years living cheek by journey 24 7 with terrorism. And I've now had to endure people who, through a 30, 40 year telescope, if I can use it like that, decide how we did our job back all those years ago in the 70s and 80s. It's quite ridiculous. I do hope that the police will give some tangible support to that young constable, whom I believe must not be a fall guy. Uh, I, I hear what you say, sir. Uh, I think you need to concentrate very carefully on what I said, and I'm quite happy to agree to it has to be a matter of very real regret for any commissioner of the metropolis to be in a situation where one of his officers has, when, where there has been a finding that uh, somebody has died as a result of the action of one of his officers. That is a simple statement of fact. Um, it is right that there is a discipline hearing that will take a fair process and it is right that the DPP considers his position uh, on the matter. Uh, that is not jumping to judgment. But it is right that I recognise the very sad loss of a life, and it is right that I recognise the observations of the inquest and the conclusions of the jury. Lady Mayor, name and organisation. Mayor of the Jackson, I've got two short questions. Um, one of them, you said that missing the royal wedding, you had 5,000 people on the streets, and that was roughly 16% of your manpower, but that was an unrealistic proportion because of shifts and I have a question about specialisation. Um, there does seem to have been a huge amount of specialisation in recent years in the police. And that this could maybe be said to take it to pigeonhole officers so tightly that they're not available for other things, and so that they limit the strength that whether, whether we call it frontline or on the streets or visible or whatever, um, but they are so narrowly specialised that it actually detracts from the overall policing effort because it takes away flexibility. Um, the second question I'll just say, um, do you have any comments on the policing of the tunnel protest? Um, because I think that sent a very different message about policing of protests. Um, it disrupted this area of London hugely for weeks on end. It cost vast amounts of money to everybody who been working on that year. Um, and yet, nothing seems to be done about it. Okay, well thanks for that, Mary, and I'm deeply grateful that when you started off with 16%, you were not going to test my mathematics, which is certainly not my strong point. Right. So thank you for that. Um, I, I guess I'd just simply say, I, I, did, I just disagree with it, really, um, of the issue of specialisation. And I think that's what I was trying to talk about, of the sense of the balance of the policing. The idea that in the 21st century, we can have the omnicompetent, all singing, all dancing officers that can do anything, is, is beyond my, from my professional perspective. Uh, and why would I say that? Well, you know, to investigate human trafficking requires a level of specialisation. Are we saying we shouldn't do that well? To investigate rape and serious sexual offence needs specialisation. Are we saying we should improve the way we do that? To be the leader of a homicide team requires very significant experience that can't just be picked up by somebody saying it's just a managerial role. That's been tried in the past in the police service. It has led to disaster. We have to get the balance right and certainly the 
financial challenge we face are going to be extraordinarily challenging in maintaining that balance of modern policing. But it does no good to the public, and no good to the profession that I lead, and no good to the colleagues that I work with to deny the balance of modern policing and the requirement of that to reduce risk in our society. I am passionate about putting uniform cops on the streets of London, but let's be perfectly honest. Unless we do these other things, those, those streets will not be available, not be safe enough for the uniform cops to actually patrol them. The way in which we investigate kidnap in this city, hugely successful in a model, an international model, and admired the world program. If we don't do that, then we have a level of disorder and behaviour by serious criminals in the city who will be in our streets are certainly a lot less safe than those of the time. So I guess I go back to where I started. We disagree. Uh, as to the talent relation, I try to think, thinking back, of course, I've done quite a lot since then, well, I've done three, quite a lot since then. Well, I, was it about lasted 70, 72 days, I think? And I do agree with you, very extraordinarily expensive. It's something that the kids and I discussed long and hard, and we'll continue to discuss long and hard, of how we get the settlement from the government in various places, and how I get settlement from the mayor, as to how we pay for capital city policing responsibilities. I guess it's cheap shot. Good job. <laughs> I see no cash in my way at this moment in time. Um, but you know, that required real delicacy. And actually, I do take my hat off to the cops that did it. Because the way in which uh, that community were able to mobilise without any ability for us to gather intelligence or infantry, because it would have been actually wrong in many respects, was very challenging to us. We had to maintain as much as we could the road away wherever we could, maintain that as a peaceful demonstration, conscious of the, what, what was going on, conscious of the tensions, and conscious of the indication that we did get that certain members of that society might actually do some extraordinary and dangerous things themselves. It was a very difficult policing operation, but like always, there were people who said we're too robust, and the people who said we're too soft. I guess I go back and pray in, and I really never thought I'd do this, pray in the support of Simon Jenkins and say, we're just going to make this right. Negative, gentlemen. You. Oh, Alex Carla. Um, as a result of several years of close observation of counter-terrorism policing, the optimist in me believes that if Osama bin Laden had been holed up in a relatively recently built fortress in Abbott's Bromley, as opposed to Abbottabad, he probably would have been found much earlier as a result of the regional organization of counter-terrorism policing, which you rightly mentioned and praised. Can I tempt you to give a view as to whether you would be disappointed if the government grasped the wider metal of police organization and recognize that regional police expertise is a very good model and that the continuation of 43 territorial police services is really no longer realistic? Um, I was going to say thank you for that. Um, uh, firstly, uh, I'd like to agree with you. I would like to think that we would. That's your first point. Secondly, uh, and I think you know very well, uh, that I cannot respond to that without saying, of course, it has been my position uh, for many, many years and led the debate in policing that we actually do need to restructure uh, the basis uh, for peace force in the country. I've held that view for a long time. It is not a view that currently has popularity. Um, it is simply not going to happen. That doesn't alter my view that at some stage in the future I think that will be a necessary and rational thing to do. I actually think it's not also so it's <coughs> able to do how we respond to the increasing financial pressures and the increasing demands to provide specialists while still providing those uniform assets and visible to the public. Um, but I've got to work within the realms of the current situation and it's for government and parliament to decide the structure of peace. I will continue to advise and behave responsibly for <coughs> advice and accept the reality of the current situation and get on with it as far as I can. But I do agree that there is a need to keep in view long-term reforms that could be necessary to and, and beneficial to the structure of peace. I think I just about managed to Gentlemen there, they look. John Sorkos, um, long retired from various addresses up and down my um, You mentioned in the course of your extremely interesting address the need for both maintaining and clarifying the concept of operational independence. And I recall that the, the official Ministry of Crime Covers Home Office um, 
the, the, the notion of operational independence is attached to the status and role of the individual constable, the ministerial officer of the crown. Is there a need in the modern day with vast aggregates of organized this led from very high levels to redefine or reassert the operational independence of the individual constable? Well, of course, so part of me is tempted to say yes, but that immediately challenges my capability of commanding an organisation of some 50-odd thousand people and 32,000 plus cops, all of whom would then say, well, I'm independent, you know where you can go. Um, but there is a need for us to, and sometimes go back to the past a little, there is a need for us to ensure that we value where we came from. There's a need for us to recognise the wisdom that appeals to the founding principles. And operational independence can sometimes sound like uh, senior police officers just want to keep our keg. Nobody else gets a uh, bite of it, and actually it's about retaining our power. It isn't. I think it's critical about impartiality. And I do think the public should strongly value the impartiality of the police. They will forgive us many sins. <coughs> they will forgive us many mistakes, but I don't think they'll ever forgive us for becoming politically impartial. And actually that's my responsibility to ensure that we never sound that way appear that way. The government structure should know also always recognise that. Is there a need for us to better define that on the individual constable? Uh, perhaps, but of course, in the current discussion, there have been <coughs> many exchanges that say, should we try and de define operational independence and not? Of course, the attempt to do that in itself could actually define a way the actual operational independence we're seeking to, we're seeking to achieve. That's why I say structures are important, guidance is important, strategic policing requirements are important, but actually, will come down in the end to uh, relationships and good work to actually serve the communities that are paying for wages. A couple more questions for you? Just a look back, name and organisation. Um, Bernard J. Hill. I'm chair of the all-party group in Parliament on Home and Security. But it's about protests, um, if I may ask, ask you. I mean, you must know how instantly corrosive it is of public trust when it is evident that, the, that we have lost control of the situation on the streets of our capital. And, uh, uh, and once the press sense that weakness, they capitalize on it as a great story and reinforce that sentiment. Um, and that must occur, I mean, to be facile perhaps, because there's been a misappreciation of, of the initial situation or a shortage of resources or a failure of Techniques, te te tactics, techniques, and procedures, or a, a breakdown in um, some technology like communication, as we also saw in this incident. And is there an, an, an instant response to these situations to make sure that they don't repeat themselves at the same time as constantly the protesters are gaming uh, the, the police tactics to try and capitalize uh, on what might have been a success in the previous protest? to turn that into a weakness of the police in a future protest. And doesn't there need to be a more um, proactive public response uh, to show that uh, you're constantly learning from these incidents, rather than uh, the, the impression that we get at the moment that um, it's, it's a bit passive, and it may be unfair to put you in that position, but that is the way I think the public feel when some of these things go wrong. Well, I don't think, Bernard, that you could take from anything I've said tonight anything about being passive or failing to learn the lessons or recognising the intercoms of the group. Quite the reverse. I just think that's what we must do. Neither should you make the mistake of actually thinking that we will resign from actually acknowledging when we do make mistakes. An organisation of public bodies that refuse to acknowledge that sometimes that is inevitable, actual organisation will demonstrate that we are unwilling to know. The very fact that we did that particularly around the, the, the dreadful invasion of the party of the Hortus and our response, uh, we came up quickly and said, we got it wrong and why, I think is about an organisation that is willing to learn and is willing to actually implement things the next time. I do think uh, we have a right to expect sort of informed public representatives to actually make sure they do everything they can to understand the facts. And I do think uh, that we have a right to expect some sort of intelligent appreciation of what we tried to do over the previous decade, when there wasn't that level of public disorder, 
uh, to reduce the commitment we made of asset to police and public order in London and to actually for, the, for our communities to feel the benefits by redeploying those officers more consistently on the streets. Uh, but I, I, I've made a lot of it. Uh, we got to call, we got to call that day and it was all wrong. Um, we properly got chastised by, by, by the media, uh, by politicians, by the press, by everybody. We got it wrong. But I would counsel against this counsel of perfection, this idea that there is some perfect way of responding to a public order and guaranteeing that there will be no incidents of violence. Because if that's the case, I don't recollect it in all of my 36 years of peace. I don't recollect, and this is not about medical excuses, I don't recollect any previous commissioner managing to ensure that that level of disorder where people are intent on breaking this order didn't take part on the streets. The issue is how they respond to it, how they know. And I would counsel against this idea that there is some sort of nirvana, perfect intelligence framework that will mean that we can predict all these things in advance. It is undoubtedly the case that some of the people who committed offences that we charged got caught with hysteria and would not have had uh, to come to our attention, nor, nor legitimately should we be looking at them in advance of those events. And one's almost tempted, it's a little flippant, I think, to say there's, a, there's almost an encouragement sometimes to say to them, anybody with a, a pair of dirty trainers should be designated anarchists. I know that's not what you said. Or in a balaclava. Or in a balaclava, <laughs> but then again, they're not wearing balaclavas when they turn up. Uh, and and I, I think we've got to go back to my comments. Do we really want to go to a situation where we serve everybody before the administration? That would be a stupid, ridiculous thing to do.